okay? I think you can start. Hi, we can't hear. Um, your mic is off if you are speaking. Alright, so good evening everyone. Um, I'm Irudaya Raj. I have my colleague EJ. So we are happy to have a workshop with you guys today. So, so the topic for the workshop today is cloud native web development. Okay, so we are, we are basically a department in ST Engineering which purely works on data analytics projects and products. Right. So, a quick intro to ourselves. I'm a Irudhi Raj, assistant principal software engineer. My colleague EJ, uh, she's a software engineer, and we both are working on a product in uh, ST Engineering. Right. So, a quick agenda. It's not going to be a very exhaustive session. Right. Very basic, very simple. So you can follow during the workshop as well. So we'll start with the introduction. Yeah. Then. We are, going to be, we are going to be talking about the Spring Boot, basics of uh, the technology. Then, section three, Angular basics. Four, how you can kind of integrate both the technologies to build your uh, web application. Then, we are going to be touching uh, some concepts on DevOps. So, how you can bring in DevOps into your uh, web development. Okay. Then, finally, we'll have uh, question and answer. We'll also give you some reference, uh, some resources that you can follow up and to get more understanding on these technologies that we're going to be uh, working with. All right, so. Okay, so the first slide, introduction to web development. So I think one, two, three. Okay, okay some of you can say what, uh, what your understanding is about uh, web development. If someone can give a try. Any volunteers? All right, let me give a try then. So web development is actually the process of creating, building, and maintaining websites and web applications. There are two types of, uh, uh, of websites, right? One, you have a website which is purely an information-based uh, website, kind of a static website, I would say, right? Secondly, you have web applications. So the second is what we are mostly going to be working today. So it's kind of a web application which dynamically changes the information on the website. So say for, the, for this uh, workshop, you may have a website where you keep changing the Okay, where the websites will keep changing the information. So there's someone, some admin at the behind, changing something, and when you see the website, the information is uh, uh, refreshed there. And that's the type of application that we are going to be building today. Okay, then when it comes to web application development, there are, I think, there are two important uh, elements here. One is the front end, another one is the uh, back end. So when I say front end, Frontend is a collection of tools, libraries, and predefined components to develop web interfaces. Okay, so there are a set of defined uh, technologies framework that you can make use. So some of the examples of frontend framework could be your HTML, CSS, uh, and so on. You must have heard about the latest trends like React, Angular, uh, Vue, then Electron.js, and so on. You can, you can name. There are plenty of libraries these days. Then there's going to be a backend. Again, similarly, a backend framework is a collection of tools, libraries, and predefined components to develop your backend software. So the backend is going to be 
uh, handling all your business logics all right um, say for example if you have a, a simple to do application of course during this workshop we are going to be talking about a to do application right so for a to do application your business use case will be if you want to add add a to do basically you want to manage you want to edit the title you want to mark the to do as completed so those are the business use cases which mostly sit behind your website okay so there is some software that is handling this data part for you and later part of the uh, workshop we will be discussing how these things are connected front end and back end okay so okay let's Yeah, so as I was talking, when it comes to web application, this is the base architecture. Okay, so okay, it starts with the user. User, okay, all of us can be a user. So we go to a browser, you type in the URL, then you get a web page, right? So this web page is served for you from a backend guy, and which can be your uh, front end HTML. Basically, you get the HTML on the browser. Right, so HTML is nothing but uh, another markup language you use to uh, represent your user interfaces. Then, uh, okay, this box, which is a backend, uh, that has act actually the business logic, and this business logic is exposed to people uh, via something called web services. These days, you also come across, come across this term called web services, right? Then, the database. So, at the end, you need something to uh, persist your data, to store your data, right? So that's where you have this database. And backend, okay, this backend is supposed to be talking to the uh, database, okay? Then there's also another layer. So this backend is kind of abstracting everything to the browser, okay? And this can also talk to some third-party applications. Say, for example, uh, a better example would be let's say SimPass, right? So if you open the SimPass application, you must have noticed it has an integration with the various other applications. So you have Iris, you have MOH, and so on. So those are the backend things that are happening, and there is a backend that is uh, handling the data and the communication between the uh, external services. Okay, so that's pretty much about the architecture of the web application. Okay, by the way, I think I want to make this very interactive. Yeah, if you feel that you can ask something, just feel free to raise your hand and then ask questions. Okay. Um, it's only a two hour workshop. We may not be having a very detailed one. We hope we can give you very basic things of uh, uh, this uh, workshop. Okay, coming back. Uh, okay, we talked about the web application. What is a web application? What are the uh, different components and architecture? Then, this slide is about cloud native development. That is the core of our workshop today. Okay, so until certain point of time where the cloud technologies uh, became very uh, famous, okay, uh, there was a need for the softwares to adapt to this cloud uh, cloud platform. Okay, so what happened until the cloud platform? Like, if I talk about the cloud, um, you have the Amazon. <coughs> Google, uh, yeah, those are the cloud providers. So these are the providers who give you infrastructure to run your software. Okay, so unlike the previous days where if a software has to run, you need to uh, you know, hire a room, buy the servers, buy rack, buy all your uh, network equipments, set up everything. Okay, then, then there is a software engineering team, they install the software for you, and there is a uh, you know, operation, ongoing operation going on, kind of a maintenance of the software and all that. And that's what is happening. And when cloud was introduced, these things are already made possible to the cloud. So the infrastructure team doesn't have to hire, uh, you know, people or rent a room to maintain the software. So it is important for software developers to make a software adaptable to the cloud uh, environment so uh, there are some uh, I would say 
requirements must have requirements that every software should have in order to be portable to uh, uh, cloud okay so what is a cloud uh, native development okay so it refers to set of practices and methodologies that leverage cloud computing principles to build and deploy applications so All right, so it's set of practices, methodologies that you leverage. Uh, so your software becomes adaptable. It can be uh, run, executed on the cloud uh, platforms. So it emphasizes on certain uh, characteristics. So agility, scalability, resilience by designing applications to take full advantage of cloud services, such as microservices architecture, containerization automated infrastructure management okay i think we will we will touch on these three aspects today okay we are going to be developing a to do microservice application we will containerize the application then we will show you how you can automate the uh, deployment okay then it also uh, what, what is the purpose of this uh, cloud native development at the end of the day for software engineering teams in order to increase the development speed and for the organizations to properly utilize the resource is very important okay and that's what is achieved by this uh, cloud native uh, era cloud, cloud native uh, application uh, development era okay it's kind of a slide okay which i think uh, which we will tell you guys what are the tools that we are going to be using uh, during this workshop okay okay uh, can I assume everyone has installed all this in your laptop if not I think it's okay we can we can give the slides to you guys later you can go to so for this workshop we are going to be using JDK the backend is going to be developed on Java then the Spring Tool Suite is actually a IDE. Then you have VS Code for developing a front-end application. Then, yeah, you need a Docker. It is for containerization, right? We will, we will bundle your software into a container image. Then the, the working code for this workshop is also available on the GitHub. So during the workshop, if you want to copy some code snippet, you can copy from there. So what is important is you understand the concept, OK? And not necessarily you need to have an output during the workshop. Take time to digest the concepts, go through the uh, GitHub source code uh, on your free time as well. Okay. 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 So the next section is about Spring Boot basics. So coming back, uh, initially I was talking about when it comes to web application, there are two things. One is a front end, another one is a back end. So the Spring Boot technology is actually uh, comes in the in the back-end framework okay although it can be used for some front-end activities it is widely used for back-end development okay so let's go back all right a bit introduction to the spring boot so spring boot is an open source java based framework designed for creating standalone production grade spring applications with the minimal configurations powerful tool to create web and microservices okay so this framework this Spring Boot framework kind of help software engineering teams to focus on the business use cases. Okay, so when you develop a software, when you develop a software, it is important that you have enough time to focus on your business use case. Okay, and the framework should be able to take care of the non-functional, non-business requirements. I would say some of the. Okay, can someone say what is a non-functional uh, requirement? Give a try. Someone from group four. Kind of abstract the lower level details of the business case implementation. Yeah. 
okay nice good try <laughs> yeah it, it, it's actually a good thing kind of abstraction so um, very basic element is logging like in your software engineering project you need a framework that can log what happens in the software so it becomes easy for it to troubleshoot what has gone wrong when the application goes live so logging is the one that you don't have to, as a developer you don't have to start coding anything so the framework should give it to you okay then another aspect will be um, monitoring say your software uh, has gone live people are using it you want to monitor how the application is behaving okay this is a non functional requirement okay and this is kind of uh, required for for any software that you develop okay that is uh, the second one the third one will be the dependencies i think if you have worked with some you know, started a software engineering project you must have had you know uh troublesome managing the dependencies when i say dependencies you may include some uh, open source library to your software okay so if you are building a uh, a simple front end simple front end you may download you may refer some javascript library the existing library and if the library uh, has an update you need to go manually update it as a developer you need to do that right so in software engineering this is not supposed to be done by developers there must be a framework which should be doing this for, for you because if you focus on this you will be uh, you know you'll be in, you cannot be focusing on the business use case the, the, there should be very less effort that should be spent on this kind of business things so this spring boot framework kind of uh, uh, provides all these features so you just focus on your business use case so if you are developing a to do application you you focus on developing a service to create a to do to edit your to do delete and to list all the to dos those are the only main things that you should be focusing as a software engineer the other things like whether the service is available for people all the time and all that should be taken care by some framework and spring boot does that very uh, very quickly right so some of the features right then this spring boot has a embedded tomcat uh, inside meaning you can bundle this uh, java package and when you just run your java package it comes with a predefined application server inside okay unlike the other days like if you have to install your application right you got to install the application server like tomcat or ibm websphere you install them then you deploy the application inside okay then you can also configure any other application server then this framework kind of give you a starter project later during the demo i i can show you what is the starter project about okay you provide kind of a metadata to the uh, the framework it's going to auto generate out the code for you okay then yeah it, as i mentioned it it gives you a production ready functionality such as metrics <coughs> health check and externalized configurations so this externalized configuration is important when it comes to cloud native uh, deployments so like you want to uh, okay you don't want to restart your application to just make some configuration change okay and that that that's made possible using the spring boot framework okay and when we talk about the the web application there's also this restful api someone okay someone can tell me what this uh, this restful api seems we have we had a early dinner okay all right so restful api is an interface that two computer systems use to exchange information securely over the internet okay so these days you have data everywhere okay so if two software systems for that matter not just software system in any system uh what to communicate right they have this protocol restful api okay so there are there are some you know uh some other protocols that you know combine this they are http and sorry okay 
So let's take a look at this uh, picture. You have a client here, which is your browser. It can be a browser or it can be your mobile. Like you have mobile applications these days. So that can be your client. Okay, then it gives a HTTP request, HTTP request to the uh, server in the form of URL. So URL is um, uniform resource locator. Okay, and every resource in the server is uniquely addressed with a path here. You say, for example, this is a survey, survey application. You have a URL, which can give you a list of surveys. Uh, you can fetch survey by an ID and so on. So server is going to give you, at the end of the day, the data is stored at the database. So the server is responsible to retrieve your data and kind of expose this to the client, right? So this data format is called a JSON. So in these days, when you talk, when you work with a web application development, a software engineering teams, you'll be mostly hearing these terms, like give me an endpoint. So in a software industry, people working in a different teams may ask you, give me an endpoint to fetch all the uh, employee records. Okay, then, then people, yeah, the backend people will go just write an API for you and then they will give you kind of a JSON format. So the front end should should understand the JSON and then beautify the UI accordingly. Okay. Then, what are we go going to be doing uh, during the workshop? So we talked about the RESTful API, which is actually a general concept. We are going to be using the Spring Boot framework, which is actually a technology to develop our RESTful API. Okay. So again, when we go with the Spring Boot uh, framework, it has sub projects. Okay which will help you to develop your REST API much faster, okay? So without this framework, say, if you take about, about two days, you can use this framework to bring up your very basic REST API, I would say in, in less than five minutes. We're going to be seeing that uh, in the workshop today, okay? So uh, the important thing here is, Spring Data REST. So Spring Data REST is a sub-project of uh, Spring Boot. It's actually a framework that enhances the Spring Data repositories by automatically export, exposing the HTTP resources. So um, I'm sure you'll be uh, very well uh, familiar with the RDBMS database, right? So do you have RDBMS in your uh, school, RDBMS uh, data concepts? Can someone say what is the RDBMS uh, database? Uh, okay, nice. It's a, Good. It's a relational database mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. based on the schema and kind of tables. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly you nailed it. Thank you. So, um, with that as a base, you have a, a relational database uh, management system, and you need to have a framework that can understand your schema understand your schema, and expose that as a RESTful API. So you code very less, uh, so you can focus on the uh, business use case. And this is the project that, that aims to do that for you. We'll be uh, seeing that uh, as a demo. Then there's also this another project, Spring Data GPA. Okay. So this is another sub-project of uh, uh, Spring Boot, which connects your Java class with the database uh, tables. Say you have a to-do table, right? So this to-do table has a property, like an ID, ID of the to-do, the title, then the status of the to-do. So ideally, you will have these uh, three columns in your database table, RDBMS uh, database table. And this framework is going to uh, map this table into a Java class. Say you will have a, a Java class called item.java. So this Java class will have three properties, ID, title, status, okay? So these three fields are automatically mapped by the framework, the Spring Data JP framework, which we will uh, see later, okay? Again, for this workshop, we are going to be using a H2 database. It's kind of a RDBMS database, I would say, okay? And this H2 database is meant for development. Mostly, when you talk with the, uh, when you work with the Java applications, you will use this uh, H2 database. 
very very lightweight database i would say kind of a has someone done the uh, mobile applications here okay so what is the uh, database used in mobile application java is uh, android app especially uh, in Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. So for the mobile application, can you hear? So for the mobile application, you have this SQLite, right? So SQLite is actually a database that sits within your mobile uh, Android mobile or iOS mobile. So it's a very lightweight uh, uh, database. So similarly, H2 is actually a embedded database which is used during the development, and we don't. Um, it is not recommended to use H2 database in the production. Right. Then uh, there is another project, Spring Doc or Open API. So Spring Doc is actually another useful project which will help you to uh, create documentation for your REST APIs. So this becomes really important when there are different teams. Say in Netflix, uh, I think there are more than thousands of microservices running. And there is a dedicated uh, front-end people working on the Netflix application. So it's important for people, the front-end developers, to understand more about the REST APIs. And that's where you need the documentation. OK? And this is one uh, such library you know, that, again, uh, scans your entire Java project and comes with a beautiful uh, web interface about the uh, REST API. Okay, time to do some action. Okay, so for this workshop, we are going to be setting up the Spring Boot project, right? So, if, okay, whoever wants to try the workshop can go to this website. Yeah, so you can go to this uh, link. So, so this is basically a website, website, given by uh, Spring community. So this website will help you to uh, generate your starter uh, project, the backend project, okay? Let me go here. Thank you. Yes. You have your chair okay, for you. Okay. Uh, no problem. Okay, so I'm going to this website now. So it's called a Spring Initializer. So you can go to this website and give a uh, basic project metadata of, of this thing. So for this workshop, we are going to be creating a Java backend uh, for to-do. So you'll have a simple UI where you can list all the to-do. You can add, uh, edit, delete. OK, so to start with, I'm going to uh, say what is the 
build management tool. So I'm going to be using May 1 for this backend. And I'm going to be using Java language again. Okay, and then the Spring Boot version is 321. Okay. Then uh, when it comes to Java application, th there's something called a package. So package is nothing but you can zoom in a bit. Zoom in. Is it clear? Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. So I'm going to say it's usually a group is uh, group represents your company. Say if you're working for a company, right? Uh, the group refers to your company. Say for example, I use com dot uh, st, okay, st ing, and artifact is actually your your application name. Say I give uh, to do microservice. Okay, to do demo. Okay, to do demo. Okay, so the name you can be uh, giving the same thing. Then a kind of a description about your project. So this is a Java. This is microservice. Yeah, for to do backend. Okay, then the website is going to auto generate the package name for you, and the Java version is uh, 17. And after I complete the application, I want this to be packaged in kind of a jar file. So in Java, you have two kind of uh, packaging. One is a jar, another one is a var. So jar is the one that we will be using for this workshop, right? So after that, you need to choose what are the dependencies that you are going to use for this project. So for any typical uh, Spring Boot microservice, there are a few things required here. So I listed already in the uh, slide. So the main ones are web, Spring Web, right? Then you need to have uh, H2. Okay, so you need the H2 database for this application, and you need a JPA, kind of a right. Then you also need the REST repositories. So you can choose here. So these are the dependencies for this project. So once you choose all these dependencies, right, you should be able to generate a base, a Java code for your project. So I generate, Spring sorry? Spring box, uh, open thread. Okay, I'll add it later. So this website, okay, you, okay, I've downloaded a starter project for you. I cut this. It's very, very. Okay, it's basically a zip file. So you unzip the file, right? Okay, so I unzip the file. So the, the, the starter project is ready. So I'm going to import this project into a IDE now. It's called a Spring Tool Suit, right? So I already have the IDE with me on my laptop, so I can kind of open. Okay, so this is the ID. It's very small. Hold on. I try to increase this.
but I try to increase the font size in my system. Okay. Okay, I'll see. On your slide. On your slide, I think you can look at your the one nearer. So I open the Spring tool suit now. So I'm going to import the project. So first, right click on the IDE, choose this uh, import. Then you choose the option uh, existing May one projects. So just now the Spring initializer project has given you the starter project, which is a May 1 uh, build tool. So you can click on that existing May 1 project, then choose the unzip folder. So I unzipped here. Okay. Yeah. So the IDE has detected this as a May 1 project, then click finish. So wait for the IDE to completely import the project. It's still building. So you can see here, so the new project called To Do Demo has been imported to the IDE. Right. So, um, okay, I wanted to look at closely look at the project structure here. Okay. So, firstly, you have the folder to create all your Java files. So SRC main Java. So which is uh, so which is here. Okay. So you have the yeah. So this is the folder where you'll be writing all your Java classes. Okay. Then the second one is uh, resources, and that's where you maintain all the configurations for your project. See, uh, yeah. So you have the the configuration folder here. Okay. Then uh, then you have another folder to manage all your unit test cases, which we are not going to cover in this workshop. Okay, because it's going to take a lot of time for us. So uh, that's where you put all your unit test case and integration test case uh, uh, classes, right? Then finally, I would say is a pom.xml file. So pom.xml file is a file that is detected by a May1 software uh, to manage the dependencies for your project. Okay. So yeah, you, you, you can see here. So this is the uh, May1. So it's basically an XML uh, syntax file, which contains all the dependencies for your project. So you can see here. So the advantage of this Spring Initializer website is that without this website, you have to manually create this folder structure. Okay, that's a, uh, that's something that the developer can be freed of. That's I would say a non-functional thing. Okay, so that's where this uh, Spring uh, Boot framework is a handy one. Okay, now let's uh, start the the application. So, so you right click on the project, you run as a Spring Boot application, right? So that's the option. Sorry. So this uh, okay. My laptop has a uh, Java fifteen. So you can see here, so this is Java 15, <coughs> sorry. So I'm going to configure the project to use Java 17. So go here. So add a library, it's a JRE library. Okay. 
okay so this is jdk 7 now 17 sorry so let me run the application again run as spring boot application yeah so you can see the application uh, log here the development log so finally uh, what is important is you can see here so the tomcat started on port 8080 so by default on the spring boot applications start on port number 8080 so if you if you have to access the port you go to the browser uh, see localhost 80 There you go. So your very simple Java backend microservice is up and uh, up and working now. So this is the beauty of the framework. Okay. So you don't have to write everything on yourself. You make it so the existing things, and let the framework give you very basic project uh, structure. So you build on top of that. Okay. So let's go to the. Anyone has tried? Are you all trying? Oh, for VS Code, I think um, you got to install this Red Hat Java plugin. Yeah, the Red Hat Java plugin. Yeah, For VS Code, those are the two extensions that you have.
Philippines. Um, I think it's back. It's back. It's back. There's two, there's two pantry, mm. right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay now. Yeah, so are you able to uh, run it on the VS code? Okay, we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll go one by one. Right? So, your first... Uh, okay, the Spring Boot backend is working on port 8080. So, we are going to be writing some Java classes. So, it exposes the rest, uh, RESTful endpoints. Okay, going back to the slide. Okay, so... Oops. Maybe it's this one. Oh, yeah. I better don't touch that. Okay, fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, everybody, right. you'll take a break, a ten minutes break. Yeah. We have some bentos there for whoever haven't taken yet. Okay, let's, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, there's some loose connection here. Oh. Interesting. Keeps flashing. So we come back at 7.30, is it? Yeah, we'll come back at 7.30. 7.30, yeah. Keeps so flashing. I, I, yeah. Should I call Taufik? Sure. Okay. Do we have like one extra? What? Oh, this one. Wow, I'm not very sure. Uh, it might just be this issue, because just now like... That, um, when, we, when, we, when we touch it, then he came back. Oh, okay. Um, What's the name of this? Like, HDM, USB to HDMI, is it? Uh, USB to... Mm -hmm. the, is, I think he knows the, 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 um, the Mac adapter. Oh. Okay, is it watching? Is it, is it working fine now? Is the, it works fine? The, the, This adapter in PS space. <laughs> no idea. Is there one in tote bag? <laughs> so to run the charge yeah. this. Why is the tote bag? Oh, this one from Francis. Perfect left. Did he hear us? Yes. Chatting away. <laughs> Oh, no. 
Oh, is this right? Is it okay now? It's not. Mm, I think I need to wait just a little bit. Should we call? The yeah. I think he's checking, right? He's checking inside the PS space. Maybe you can video call him. And Last time, whose adapter do you use? Uh, PS Space one, but it's not this one. It's, it's a, a like Francis thing. one. Also, it's in PS Space. Yeah, I think the one used for Friday Hats is in PS Space. Wait, there's no more adapter, right? Um, um, I, I think Taufik is finding one in PS Space, yeah. right? Yeah, he said he's... Oh, okay. I'm thinking maybe you should charge your laptop. Okay. Um, I thought it's charge. This is the cable. Oh, never mind. Is it? What? I think we can. Oh, I think your the case is oh. quite blocky. <laughs> It's not compatible, is it? Oh, is this casing? Oh, <laughs> this is another casing. Oh, you need to take off this one. Okay. Yeah. USB C to a table, yes, correct. Okay. Oh, I'm sure this is not. Oh. Can we check if it's working now with this laptop? Do you think there's something oh. wrong with my yeah, laptop? Oh, I think it's probably the adapter. Oh. It might be the adapter. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was working fine just now, and then it just went down for no reason. Right. So, okay. not Thank sure. You. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. It doesn't go down, then probably be fine. We change, we change a, a, to another adapter. Okay. Thank you. We have some, some more questions um, oh, okay. here in the Zoom chat. Yeah, you can yeah. answer. Let me just change this name to you. Mm, okay. Oh, yes. Sharing of the okay. 
Does it share? Can you? Oh, it's not sharing, is it? Okay, give me one. Okay, Taufik told me to just use this, but <laughs> it's not working. Check on him. Yeah, I think it's good. Oh, okay, it's back. Okay, nice, nice. Okay. Nice, yes. I saw it. Okay, I'll give you the message. Okay, oh, you can start answering. Yeah, yeah. Thank Everything's you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for fixing it up. Okay. Start, start again. I think I have a few questions on the, the chat here. Okay, I'll take them after the workshop. Okay, if we go into that right now, we may, may be running out of the time. There are, there are two questions, I think. Uh, very simple one, I can answer right now. Are there equivalent of Spring Boot for JavaScript? Okay, first of all, Spring Boot is actually a Java framework. Okay, so you know that 
JavaScript is a different uh, programming language. Spring Boot is a different uh, framework which is based on Java. So for Spring Boot, you need either Java, uh, Kotlin, Groovy. So if you know any of these languages, which is mostly used for backend, yeah, and that, that's more uh, uh, relevant there. Okay, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's a complete difference between JavaScript and Spring Boot. That's what I would say. Okay, and then uh, there are people asking about uh, the VS Code and Spring Tool Suit. Okay, again, there are two different uh, IDEs. People who are familiar with the VS Code, I think you can go to this website. I, I flashed the website here. You can go to this website, uh, and then it, this has all the instructions on how to configure the the Spring tool into your VS Code. So you can still use the Spring project on your VS Code. Okay, so going back. <coughs> okay, so we managed to download the starter project uh, from the website, and then we are able to run it on the local laptop, which exposes uh, port 8080. Okay, so the important in this application is the uh, app entry point. So uh, in the Spring Boot application, there is this uh, Java class. So, so this is the project. So if you look at the the folder, so you can see the folder structure. So the package name is com.sting. So you can see the to do demo application at Java. So the website has created this Java file uh, by uh, by default. See, this is a very simple Java application. If you notice, this has the main function. So in Java, this is the main entry point. This is where the framework starts your application. So the Spring Boot, okay, if you look at the, the annotation here, Spring Boot application. So this is the line that is telling the uh, Spring Boot framework that this Java project is a Spring Boot application. So you have a, you have Java underlying Java, then you have this annotation Spring Boot annotation. So the framework is going to enable all those default configurations for you. So this is the important annotation here. Okay. So okay. So you can you can copy the code here if you are uh, trying it from your laptop. Also have the same code on the uh, GitHub. Okay. Then let the next slide is about setting up a development database. So we are going to be doing a to-do application. So there is a database that stores your to-do. So for this Spring Boot application, we are going to be using H2 database. Okay, so to configure the HTTP, H2 uh, database, you basically open your application.properties file, which is inside SRC main resources. Okay, so you are going to be defining the uh, key properties for H2 database. So I just copy everything here. I'll explain what they mean. Okay, the first line is about you're telling the Spring Boot framework to enable a web interface so you can browse the database. Okay. Secondly, is actually a um, URL. It's called a connection string in the software engineering. So it's a connection string for your uh, H2 database. Then this Spring Boot has a driver class to connect to the database, so which is org h2 dot driver. So if you are using a Postgres database, you'll be having a different driver. So similarly for MS SQL, uh, MySQL, and and so on MongoDB. So for every database, you have a driver class. So you can find the driver information on on internet. You can just Google what is a JDBC driver for Postgres. Then you will get the uh, the driver class there. Then uh, you provide the username for the H2 database, which is I, I, SA, it's a default one. Then the password for this database is just a password. Then uh, this is specific to Spring Boot framework. So it's kind of a compatibility uh, between your H2 database and the Java class. So with this, we configured a H2 database for your uh, to-do application, backend uh, application. So let's Let's run the application again. So before that, I'll stop the application. So on the Spring Toolsuit, if you want to stop the application, you, you see uh, the red 
square box here I just stopped here so let me run as Spring Boot yeah so the application is up now so if you go to this URL on your local host so I copy yeah so you can see here so this is the web page on which you can browse your uh, development database okay see the password I've given was password okay right now if you look at there is no uh, table defined in this uh, application okay so if you look on the, on the left hand side you don't you don't see any database table okay so in the next step we are going to be seeing how you can create a database table here right so to do that let's go back to the slide okay so we are going to be adding a, a Java class which I would say as an NTT okay. so again bit of a theory here so NTT is actually in software engineering refers to a real world uh, object okay it can be a student in a student management software it can be a student uh, in, a, in a course so anything you see here is, a, is an object so you represent this object kind of an entity in the Java okay say for this uh, to-do application I would say item okay item as an entity so what I'm going to be doing I'm going to be creating a Java class called I, uh, item so you click on the package new class here so it's item dot Java okay so you have the simple uh, Java Java class and so I'm going to be adding uh, three properties here so for the simplicity I'm going to copy that from the github So SRC okay so this is the item.java so I'm going to be copying everything here firstly the just copy here So let me copy all the import statement as well okay so the basic Java class is ready and if you notice this Java class has uh, three properties one is the ID line number 16 then which is a type of UUID kind of a data type then you have a name which is the to-do name itself then a boolean representing whether this to-do is completed or not and if you look at the line 15 18 21 right you have uh, annotation it's called annotation in the spring boot so this is how okay so without okay uh, let me remove this so without these three lines it's a plain java code and when you add this okay when you add these three lines it is a connection to the spring boot framework so spring boot framework is going to treat your java class as a as a uh, as a special Java class actually I would say special class that can work with the rest APIs so I have a database column called ID then name then status all right so to tell there is another uh, annotation called at entity so 
so you kind of decorate a java class with art entity when you say this spring boot is going to map this java class to a database table and the database table name is say for example tbl uh, item okay so yeah so that's about creating a item dot java so let's restart the application so i i stop the application here then i this time i do a debugging thing so let me debug okay so the application is started if i go to the console now refresh the console page i got to input the password again yeah so you can see here now there is a new table called table item although there is no record right now we will be yeah we'll be writing logic how to add uh, uh, entries to this uh, table so right now it has a uh, say three column id name and status okay there is no data in it now so we are going to be doing it right now so so in spring boot there is something called j repository so jpa repository in spring boot is an api that enhances a java entity with the necessary methods to interact with the database table okay so it comes with the, you know predefined functions that can uh, work with a database table so things like inserting uh, editing deleting and fetching the records will be you know automatically added to your uh, java class if you extend this uh, api jpa repository api so what i'm going to be doing i'm going to create a new java class again in the same package uh, again if you want to go here so this time i'm going to create an interface say item repository dot java and i'm going to extend the spring boot api called jpa uh, repository right so this jpa repository is going to be a repository of items your item and the id type is uuid so i'm going to you know this is a simple java file i'm going to again decorate this java file with the annotation called at repository so when i add this repository the spring boot framework is going to add all the necessary functions for java class so you don't have to write on your own okay so the there are two java classes now ready let's restart the application there you go so after you add the the repository right you go to the browser now go to the browser you try to yeah you can see now correct you can see there are two uh, endpoints restful endpoints so so this is an endpoint that you can use to get all the items in the database okay so this kind of a restful api so you imagine you are able to bring out this rest api in a matter of uh, i think in, the, in this workshop we are doing a light thing so practically you can bring up this in just 5 minutes okay so 
So this is the output of what we have done right now. So we added an item dot Java and we enabled the repository. So the framework is going to give this uh, endpoint for you. So this is an endpoint to get all the items. Although we can't do a, a fetch right now, uh, okay, which which I'll be doing it now. So this this UI that you see here, right, is not very well documented. So to add a documentation capability for for your REST API, I'm going to be adding a new library. It's called uh, Open API. Okay. So let me go to the uh, pom.xml file. This is where you you add the dependencies for this uh, uh, Java project. So again, to add a, okay. So let me copy this. This is the library. So I'm going to add this to the pom.xml file. Then, yeah. So I added this dependency to add the Swagger uh, documentation from my application. So let me restart again. <coughs> so the application is restarting now. Yeah, so the application is up. Let me go back to the browser. Yeah, so you can see here. So these are the basic APIs. So for the item.java class, we have written the Spring Boot framework has enabled about one, two, three, four, five, six. Six APIs are ready for you. Okay, so the front end team can use this API in order to interact with your database because the front end cannot directly connect to your database. So it's it's an API that is, a, uh, that is the communication to connect to the database. So your API documentation is ready. So you can give this API documentation to the front end, front end team so they can uh, write accordingly. So let me try. I'm, I'm going to add a new to do here. So there is a UI, you can try it out. So click on the try. Uh, okay, I'm not going to insert the ID because ID is automatically inserted. I'm just going to be giving the status here. Okay, name. Say, for example, do laundry. Okay, then, okay, I have not done it yet, so false. Come on, it's missing here. Yeah, so you can see here the the request is successful. So if you go to the database, you can see the okay, you click on the table, run, click on the run here again. Yeah, so you can see a new uh, record here. So it's do laundry, ID is automatically generated by the framework, then the status is false. So you can keep adding the entries to this uh, table using the REST API. So you have a REST API to create a new item, okay? And similarly, you have you, you, you can explore. Basically, if you are trying it in your local, you can, uh, yeah, you should be able to see this uh, swag, it is, this is called a Swagger UI, okay, Swagger UI. Uh, yeah, you can try out all the functions. All right, so I think with this, I think the, the to-do backend is ready. The backend is ready. I call my uh, colleague now. She'll talk about the front end, okay? Kind of developing a UI and integrating with the, the backend. Yes, see, come on. What is coming?
the app folder is where all your code will go. So it will be mostly working over here. And then there's also the assets folder in case you want to uh, use images. You can store your images over here. And any additional style sheets will go here also. Yeah. So anyone still downloading or waiting for Angular to load? Everyone OK? Everyone OK? Everyone else okay? <laughs> Can I? Okay. Okay, so now uh, let's create a component. So you can use the Angular command line, ng generate component. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so you can use g for short, short for g short for generate and c short for component, and then just to do. Then it will create a few uh, files. It's taking very long today. Uh, OK. OK, it's done. Uh, so you can see that it generated like four files and then it also updated <laughs> one file. La. Okay, so uh, mainly what what a component is firstly is like a basic building block for Angular. Not sure if you all use like similar frameworks like React. It also like have a component as like the base unit. So components are just like uh, UI representations. So you can have like a input field as a component or like uh, we are doing a to-do uh, to do app later, so you can have like a to do item as a component. And then um, inside this, uh, okay, let's just go into the folder. You can also see that there is like a add component. Uh, in Spring Boot, it's called a uh, annotation, but in Angular, we call it a decorator. So it's, it's basically just the same, same, uh, same uh, idea. You specify like uh, what you want to call this component where you want to use it somewhere else. So this is what you will call app to do. And then there's also a template and a style URL, which is just uh, this HTML file, which just says to do works, and then a CSS file. And there's also a like test, test unit test file generated, which you can use if you want to do unit test next time. Uh, OK, so now let's just use this. Uh, let's just show that this thing works. Uh. So if I do app to do, save, and then uh, you can open it on the browser. It, it just says what, it, what the component said, uh, to do works. Yeah. So this is how you use the component. Yeah. OK. And then next, uh, service. So a service is basically just something that keeps related logic together. So for example, if you want to have a logging functionality in your entire app, but you don't want to like have to reset up the logger every time, so you put it in a service, and then every class will just import this service and use it. Okay. So we will generate a service uh, called to do as well uh, as short for service. And then I'm doing like an extra to do slash because uh, the, the service uh, API generates inside, like it doesn't generate inside a folder. So I'm just specifying the folder. Yeah. So you can see that the files are generated here. And then this is also like a, a different decorator called injectable to say that you want to use this service somewhere. 
And then over here it says provider in root, means that you want to use it everywhere in the app. Okay. Okay, so now we want to create a to-do app. So this is what we'll be making today. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip all the HTML and the styling, but you can get it from the uh, GitHub repo. This GitHub repo. Okay. Uh, then I'll be using this HTML. Uh, this is in a separate branch, uh, section 3.5, so not in the main branch. Then I'll just copy paste this. And then uh, the CSS. Okay, uh, anyone needs time to copy from the GitHub? Or oh, is everyone good? Okay, okay, so if you are done copying the HTML and CSS, right? Uh, you can see that there's an error. La. So basically, there's no to-do's object yet. So we want to make this uh, object inside our component. So we can just make like a to-do's equals to like an array of to-do's. So let's say name to laundry status false. OK. OK, and then the error disappears. Uh. Yeah. And then you can go to your browser. And you can see that this do laundry is populated over here. Yeah. Uh, I won't go too detailed into this syntax, but basically what it's doing is we have an array of to-dos, which we define uh, here. It's an array. And then uh, we are iterating through the array using ng4 and then getting like each to-do item and fetching the to-do status and the to-do name. Yeah. Okay. And then... Uh, okay. Okay, then we also want to make an interface for this to-do or a class. Uh, yeah. So we can just make a new file to-do.model.ts export interface. Um, have you all used TypeScript before? TypeScript? No? Some yes, some no. Okay. So TypeScript uh, is just JavaScript but type. So inside this interface, we are just defining the type for the name to be a string and then status to be a boolean. Okay. And then we can uh, import this here. So it matches the model or interface that we created. Okay. And then next, um, I'll just skip through the parts where you need to hook up the, like there's like some create and update function, but this is like without the back integration. So I'll just skip through this first. And then uh, we can do that in the back and front end integration part. Okay. Uh, anyone needs time to like pause and Think about stuff. Am I okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Then I'll be moving on to the Angular and Spring Boot integration. So uh, just now, Raj showed that uh, the Spring Boot app is running on port eighty eighty. So we want to connect our Angular app to the Spring Boot app. So I have uh, the Swagger UI over here on port eighty eighty. Uh, yeah, then I'll just do a get request. Okay, so through this UI, you can execute requests. Uh. So I did a get request, and then uh, it showed me the items that, are, that exist in the database currently. So uh, this name, do laundry, and status false, not done. Okay. 
So in order to use, actually like connect to the back end, you need these elements. So first you need to import the HTTP client module in your uh, entire application. So we go to the app.module and then we can just do like import oh, HTTP client module. Uh, So I imported the HTTP client module. So now I can use HTTP client uh, anywhere within the app. Uh, yeah. So I need to use, I need to import it in the to-do service. Okay. So I imported HTTP client. And then now uh, let's do the app. Uh, the get and create methods. Okay, so first the base URL. Uh, if you have your localhost backend running, you can just use like uh, localhost 8080 and then uh, slash items. And then uh, let's set up the get and create methods. Okay, so uh, I think a function here. So this is just uh, get to do taking in no arguments and then returning any. Any for now, uh, we'll change the return type later. And then uh, let's do return this.http.get this.base URL. And then, uh, yeah, I think that should be it. Okay. And then if you look at this uh, response, right? Actually, it's like you don't get the items directly. So it's like an embedded JSON object. And then inside the embedded object, there's an like items array. So we want to just get this array. We want to just get this array over here on our front end. So we can do a type. Just follow along for now. I think this will make a lot of sense, but just follow along. And then map. Uh, map is a ISJS operator that is uh, widely used in Angular. Uh, okay, and then um, do you all know map functions like JavaScript map or any like language map? Okay, yeah, uh, can. So basically, you, ju you just want to map the object, uh, the response. Uh, just say that it's type any. Map the response into just this part. So uh, response dot the score embedded dot items. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this way we can just get the items array instead of the entire JSON object. Yeah. And then um, if you look at the get method, it's returning an observable. So if you all are not familiar with observables, observables are basically like a data source. So you can have an uh, observable that emits some data and then some subscribers that will subscribe to this data to retrieve the data. OK, so we want to de define the return type as observable to do array. OK, okay then um, back to our component. Uh, let's import the service that we just wrote. So private to do service of type to do service. Okay. Yeah. Just note the import. Then uh, we want to call the get method. Service dot get to dos dot subscribe. Make sure to subscribe. If not, you don't get your data. And then to dos. Uh, so this is basically whatever is written from this get to do's observable. Whatever is written over here la, will be this. And then we want to uh, store it locally. So this dot to do's equals to to do's just to assign it to the local variable. And then now we can delete this uh, boilerplate, uh, I mean mock object. And then uh, we can go back to the 
UI and you see that uh, it's showing the do laundry or I can just add another one just to show that it works. So this is how you connect to the back end. Okay? Can. And then next, uh we want to add the create method. So let's start from the HTML side. So we have a create button over here. But it's not hooked to anything. So basically we want to hook the create button on click, so when the button is clicked, you want to call something. So you pass it a callback, uh, create, and then uh, you can pass it the value of the input field using this, this is called a template variable in Angular. So you can get the value of the input field using this, dot value. And then uh, I'll just reset the input to be empty. So now we want to create, uh, we want to make the create function. Uh, name of the to do string. And then uh, return void because we don't want to return anything from this function. Okay. So now uh, let's go back to the service and hook up the create, create to do's, create to do. Okay, so for create to do, we want to pass it a to do object. So just say to do and then type to do and then return observable of any for now. Uh, return this.http.post. So we are using a post request to create this.isurl and then pass in the uh, request body, which is the to do object. Okay, and then we want to call this function over here in the component. So this dot to do service dot create to do, and then uh, we can pass it an object. So name is what is passed into the function, and then uh, status is false. We want to set it as false first. Okay, save, and then now we go back to the browser, and then we can try it out. Okay, uh, okay, so for, for even for create, right, you need to subscribe. If you don't subscribe, nothing will happen. So everything you need to subscribe. And then uh, I'm just going to refactor this. Because uh, we want the page to refresh after we create. So just make a get all method. And then this dot get all. So uh, in this, inside this subscribe, because we don't need the response, so I'm just going to use this underscore and then just call the this dot get all method. Sorry. Wait. Wait. <laughs> uh, I didn't save. Okay, yeah, so now it works. Okay, so yeah, make sure to hook up your HTML and your uh, component logic. Yeah. Everyone still following? <laughs> Anyone lost? <laughs> okay. Uh, is anyone actually d trying out like right now? Too fast, ah? Uh? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, uh, very sorry, but I think you all need to refer to the source code later on, cause we're kind of running out of time, uh. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then for the for the update and delete. So like, if you want to you want to like 
update the to do when you click on this you want this to actually um, be set as done on your back end so you can add an update function and also a delete function for the delete button yeah so i think you all can try that at home yeah okay then just this is just slashing some code lah. then uh, i think that's it for the back end integration yeah so much yeah, Raj will take over for the DevOps part. Okay, kind of a very fast one. Yes. We have to finish by 8.30. Okay, so what we have seen so far is to uh, understand web technology and develop some backend for, for, for the application. Okay, so we learned about uh, web application development, front end, back end, and finally we saw how we can integrate the front end and back end using HTTP client. Okay, this is pretty much uh, what is done on the software industry these days. Of course, uh, there are different uh, practices that we can follow, which we won't be able to cover at this point of time. Okay, so next we talk about the uh, DevOps. Okay. So, so this DevOps comes in, uh, I would say, to deploy your application. Okay. So what is DevOps? Let me take this one. There's a slight uh, change here. Okay, so the DevOps refers to set of uh, culture and practices uh, to collaborate between the teams. So basically, on the software engineering, you have the development team and the operation team. So the development team focuses on the software development, while the operation team uh, trying to keep the application up uh, up and running all the time and at the same time the operation team is the one who is working with the, the end users trying to get uh, feedback from it and then update it to the uh, development team again so it's kind of a cycle process so DevOps aims to make this cycle process a lot easier okay and how does it do that you know set of uh, established processes are there and why do we need that we need that for better collaboration uh, continuous feedback. Okay, hold on. Yeah, continuous feedback and for the faster innovation. Then how do we do the, uh, how do we achieve the uh, uh, DevOps? It's basically by using some tools out there. The, the famous ones are Jenkins, you, you can uh, know Jenkins, then the Microsoft Azure, uh, DevOps, then you have Argo CD in the modern era. Argo CD is another another very interesting tool, uh, especially when, when you want to support the Kubernetes for your application. Okay, next we talk about the containers and dockers. Okay, so just now we have seen a front end and back end. And when we want to deploy the front end and back end, there is a set of uh, procedures that's, that must be followed. So to install your front end, you got to install the Node.js, uh, minimally JavaScript libraries, then install your package. And you hand over the steps to the development team, the operations team. So the operation team uh, follows the instruction and installs your application. So the challenge there is, while you develop your software, you use a different version. 
and when the operation team installs your application right the version might have changed so when the version uh, changes your software doesn't work okay that's one of the uh, one of the basic problems i think all the operation teams are facing so to to overcome that i think there is a concept called containers so what we do is container is kind of a, a software package i would say software package just like exe dot jar and all it's a it's a it's a technology that will package all the dependencies for your project along with your uh, software so operation can, operation team can use this image to deploy your software okay and this container images are managed by a docker docker is actually a software tool which manages the container okay so for our front end application we will be having two containers one is the front end container another one is the back end container so back end will have all the spring boot logic front end will have all the uh, angular logic okay okay so for this to work you need a docker cli again if you install docker desktop on your uh, laptops i think this cli will be enabled for you so this is kind of a, a tool tool that will help you to interact with the docker software okay so mainly there are about two uh, basic commands that we use one is the uh, command to build the container image itself which is uh, here so this is the command you have so docker build then you tag the uh, the image so with the name to do microservice okay then uh, if you want to run the container image you use this command docker build to do again the the tag name so once once you have this right you should be able to uh, access your application so i'm just going to uh, demo this to you so if you want to dockerize your uh, your application any any software application you first have to add this file called docker dot docker file so you go i don't have the file here so let me create a new file here so the name must be docker file so this is the standard uh, uh, for the container to work so you create a docker file again let me let me copy the docker instruction so on the github if you notice there is actually a docker file so in the doc oh you can't see Hold on. Okay, so in my backend project, I created a file called a Docker file. Okay, so I'm going to add the instruction here. so you can copy the instruction from github so i'm just going to copy again to learn more about the docker instructions right you can go to the official docker uh, website and learn the commands from there so basically if you look at the docker uh, instructions here you are in you are downloading the the jdk because for for a spring boot application to work you need a jdk okay so you are packaging the jdk with the container image and you need to define a working directory inside the container image so i define slash app and for my java application to build i need to copy the maven uh, maven file to the container then uh, this is the command that will um, you know compile your java application and copy the file into the working uh, directory then once the container is ready you're going to run this command spring boot run command which will run the 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 backend okay so when the container is started so so this file is kind of a metadata for the 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 devops i would say the devops tool to identify that your application is a container application okay So once you create this Docker file, your container uh, is ready. 
So you can go here. So I'm going to open the So I have a Docker desktop. It's taking a long time actually. Come on. It takes a long time to open the application. So in the meantime, what I can okay. Yeah, so I have installed the Docker desktop already on my laptop. So there are so there are some commands. So to list all the container images, you use this Docker images. So right now, I think before this workshop, I built this uh, uh, service. You can see a new uh, image here. Okay. So for I'm I'm going to build the same thing for for our to do application. So let me go to this directory. So from here, I'm going to build the container image for the backend. So I need to copy this command docker build to do. Okay, so docker build dash t. This this can be any name. So doc to do microservice uh, workshop. And this this dot is very important. Dot specifies the context. So the docker build command is going to look for the docker file in the current working directory. Okay, so when you put dot, it's going to look for the docker file in the current working directory. So I enter. So what happens at this point of time is the docker is looking at the, the instruction here. So you see the instruction here. So it's going to first download the, the JDK and follow uh, the instructions one by one. You can see now. Okay, it's it's downloading bunch of things here. It's taking a while actually. Yeah. So you can see the the image is uh, ready now. So I can do Docker images. Yeah, you can see a new uh, Docker image. So the name is uh, To Do Microservice Workshop. By default, it is tagged with the latest, and you can see this was built about 11 seconds ago. And the size of this is about yeah five six seven meg. Okay. So your this is how you containerize your application. So the same thing must be followed for the front end application. We are not going to uh, uh, show this right now. You can try this out. So you can go to the, the GitHub, go to the front end directory, try to create this uh, uh, Docker file. And for building an Angular application, you may have to write a different set of uh, uh, Docker instructions. Okay, because for the Java application, you need a Java uh, to be available, but for the Angular, you need the Node to be available. So the instructions may be different, All right? Uh, yeah. So the since the image is ready, I can I can run the image. So before that, I can I can stop because I already run the application on port eighty eighty. So I'm going to run the 
the container now. So to run the container, I can go here. Same Docker run. So you can you specify port eighty eighty. Okay, you need to specify the tag as well. Dash T. So you need to say. Yes, there you go. So you can see that the backend is started now on port 8080 by default. Okay, so you can come to the thing. Yeah. So this is how you containerize your application. So once you containerize your application, you can deploy this to the the, um, the Azure cloud. So I'm going to show you a demo which I have, which we have deployed already. Okay. So for this demo, right, you need a Microsoft Azure account. Okay, you need a Microsoft Azure account, then the GTAP account, then the Docker Hub account. So there's, I think, another one interesting thing I think I, I, we can share. Docker Hub is actually a repository, public repository, where you can see all the Docker images. So I think these days, in every software uh, contains a Docker image. So you can go to the Docker Hub. Just like your uh, GitHub, where you can find all the source code, this is the place where you can find all the uh, uh, the images, the container images. Say for this workshop, I have already uh, created a Docker image. You can see here on my account. So on my account, I push the the container image. Okay. So anyone who want to deploy my application, right, can just use the docker run command on their laptop like in your laptop you can, you should be able to run this uh, to do application okay it's that simple so what we are eliminating here is you don't have to install java and other dependencies to uh, to run this application you just have to do a docker run and it's going to uh, uh, run this container image because this container image contains all the dependencies inside okay so that's about docker hub Okay, then uh, we are going to be using the GitHub workflow and GitHub actions. Okay, so let me go to the repository. So in the GitHub repository, you can click on the actions here. So click on the action. So you need to define a workflow. Workflow is basically you are telling, okay, an instruction, set of instructions um, you're giving to deploy your application. So basically what I want, I want uh, my application to be containerized and to be pushed to a Docker Hub. Later, this can be used on my Azure uh, cloud, okay? So I already have two workflows here. The first workflow, Yeah, so if you look at the content of the workflow, yeah, so it's basically set of instructions. You set up the job, build the Docker image, then build, push it to the Docker Hub. Then there are a bunch of uh, post activities actually, which we are not interested in right now. So you can see the, the workflow file actually. So the entire container image is dependent on the Ubuntu uh, uh, image, okay? And similarly, we have actions for the front end, the Angular application. So you click on the actions here. So, yeah. 
yeah, again this contains set of instructions to build your uh, front end application. Okay. So once this is uh, ready, once you set up the actions on the GitHub, you can open a Azure account. It's it, I think I created a free account now for this workshop, which has about 200 credits. So I can go to the Azure. Uh, go to the Azure. Yeah, I've already created. So if you want to create, a, if you want to deploy your container, right? So you can click on the create resource here. So on the left hand side, you create, you select the container, the container, then you create a container app. Okay. So in the container app, you provide the basic information. Okay. Say for example, uh, I want to create a uh, NES demo. Okay. Then my app name is NUS to do backend. Right. Then on the Azure, you need to choose your uh, your region. Right now, I choose to East Asia. Then, so this is where you mention all the the container uh, details. Like you you want to. You want to download the container image from the Docker Hub. Click on this. Uh, then you mention your image name. Just now I have I've shown this to you, so I need to copy this. This is the image name. Go here. Okay. Then it must be a latest image. Uh, yeah. So these things I think you can just leave it to the default. Don't have to change anything. Then you kind of enable the HTTP uh, for this uh, application. So you choose the ingress. You want to accept the traffic from everywhere because at the end of the day, you want to connect your front end application to this uh, REST API, right? So you ignore all the things here. So the target port is 8080. Create. There you go. So the deployment is in progress now. So what it does is, it's going to download your container image from Docker Hub and uh, start running it on the Azure Cloud. Yeah, so the deployment is successful now. Let me go here. So this is the application URL. takes a while yeah so you can see here uh, you should be able to see the swagger UI yeah so so you're just seeing your application running on Azure Cloud. This is the, the API, and we have already deployed the front end before the demo, so let me take that. So, so this is the front end that we have deployed on the, uh, on the Azure already. I know this is a bit rush for you. We have the uh, tutorial, the resources for you on the uh, PPT. Later, we'll share the thing to the organizers. You can share them uh, to them so they can follow up. I think there is a very good video on the presentation, half an hour video, which you can go through to deploy the application on the Azure DevOps. Okay, then. Okay, I think we are at the final stage already. We have some references for you. Yeah, firstly, the, the, the workshop content itself, the GitHub. Yeah. Then the, the Spring Boot. Yeah, you can get all the concepts of Spring Boot from the website. Yeah, then there is a YouTube video that you can follow.
to deploy the applications on Azure again. Then there are, there are yeah, so you can also go through about GitHub Actions, then the Angular itself. Okay. Yeah, of course, these are useful links that you can take it for further reading. Okay. Finally, right, if you want to join ST Engineering, I think, uh, yeah, for internship, you can scan this QR code, uh, bookmark uh, in your thing. So, any questions? I think uh, maybe, maybe let me go through the chat here. <coughs> 